Joining us for our pollster panel today are Krista Jenkins from the FDU Public Mind Poll, Patrick Murray of the Monmouth University Poll, and Ashley Koenig from Eagleton. And moder moderating today's panel is the number one power broker on Politiker NJ's 2015 power list, our own Michael Aaron from NJTV. Michael, take it away. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks for inviting me and us. Uh, hello to all my good acquaintances and friends in the room. Uh, we have a terrific panel here, the three top pollsters in New Jersey. Um, we're in an interesting climate where polls are indeed, as Michelle said, coming out every day. And uh, we live with them and we uh, make our snap judgments based on them, but let's learn a little bit more about them. Uh, the last session that we were treated to uh, was more raucous than this one will probably be. Yes. We'll, um, <laughs> this will be the cerebral 45 minutes, and then comes the governor. Who knows how he's going to be? But uh, let me start with Krista. How do you conduct an accurate poll? What are the keys? I think the elements of accuracy is that you're drawing a probability sample, which means that everyone in your population of interest has a known chance of being selected. And from that, you're able to you know, basically come up with a number that estimates how close your, 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 your sample is from the larger population. It's the margin of error. Um, so I think that is the, the, really the foundation of a good, um, uh, a good public opinion run that, poll. Run that by us again. Sure. Uh, you, it, it's in, in selecting the sample? That it, it really is in selecting the sample. So you want to make sure that you're not injecting any bias into who it is that you're speaking with. Uh, meaning that, of course, everybody has an equal chance, basically, of being selected uh, from the population that you're interested in studying. And, of course, the other thing that you have to keep in mind when you're drawing a probability sample is distribution of landline versus cell interviews because we all know that we are increasingly living in a world where people are reachable either only on their cell phone or mostly on their cell phone. Uh, the recent estimate nationwide is that around 60 percent of U.S. households are reachable either only or mostly on cell phones. So you certainly have to supplement your, your sample with, an, with a healthy number, an adequate number of, of uh, cell phone interviews. Um, so I think those are the two, I think, pieces of information that if you're a consumer of polls that you're going to want to know. First, how were people selected to be in the sample? Was it a probability sample, a random sample? And then the second question that you would want to ask, of course, is, you know, do you have an adequate number of cell interviews versus landline interviews? That's sort of the, the, quick, the quick and dirty, I think, answer I would give to that question. Ashley, uh, what would you add to that? I think Krista gave a great explanation, and I think in the world of polling nowadays, we see all different types of polls. We see online surveys now. We see kind of these opt-in surveys, these Insta polls, especially after a debate. Can we trust those? Well, that's a big question. So I, I think a lot of us up here are getting this whole issue of are polls accurate nowadays? Or can we trust them? Um, are people getting poll fatigue? And you know, I, I think getting back to what Krista was saying, I think it is that, that gold standard of the probability sample and a mixture of landlines and cell phones and the ability to be representative to the general population that we get through telephone surveys and through random sampling that allows us to do what we do and claim accuracy with this, within a certain margin of error. So for example, if you take something like, if you take a sample of blood at the doctor's office for blood tests or you, or you taste a bit of soup or sauce when you're cooking it on the stove, that's an example of sampling. So just like you wouldn't have all the soup on the stove because you obviously want to save some, you take a little bit of a taste, that's how we know through these random samples that we're selecting people randomly and we can generalize to the population. Patrick, what would you add to what we've heard so far? How to conduct an accurate poll? Uh, with response rates and polls now below 10 percent. What does that mean? That people won't respond, people won't answer the question? They hang yeah, they up? Answer, they won't even pick up the phone and, and those kinds of things. I find that tossing darts at a dartboard is probably a good method. Right now. I'm <laughs> joking about that. No, but um, what we're finding is that there's a a, a variety of methods now. Uh, we're in a time when the polling, uh, <coughs> uh, the polling field is changing very rapidly because it has to. Uh, and why I, does it have to? Because of the things that uh, Krista and Ashley brought up, which is the, the changes in how we can contact people. When I started uh, polling 20 years ago, 
uh, we were getting the 65 to 70 percent response rates easily by calling a random digit dial telephone sample of households because 95 plus percent of households uh, in any population that we were looking at had a landline. We could use a random method to generate telephone numbers, which would include unlisted and new telephone numbers, so that we knew we were catching everybody, and a, a large portion of them would actually participate in those polls. In over 20 years, I've seen that change radically to now, it's, as I said, it's less than 10% who are doing that. But we found that up until, I would say, the last couple of years, though, the lower the response rate did, didn't <coughs> affect the poll's accuracy. And that's the key. It was the response rate affecting polls' accuracy. When you read something, and every, every newspaper article will publish this, which is the margin of error of a poll based on the sample, that's no longer as uh, meaningful as it once was. Because the margin of error of a sample is based on the fact that you were actually able to get everybody in the sample to participate. Uh, when you're only able to get one out of 10 people who you select initially in your sample to participate, and you're replacing them with other people, then the margin of error no longer applies as a statistical method as well as it did before. And so what we're looking at is a bunch of other things that we're doing right now, particularly like if you're doing elections, in low turnout elections. This is one of the things, you know, turnout's going down, response rates are going down. That increases the probability for error when you're doing an election poll because it's harder to figure out exactly who it is that's going to show up to vote. They don't look like the people who don't show up to vote anymore. Uh, and uh, you're not sure that your sample that you got you to begin a, with is, is me, accurate. You have a poll out this morning of <coughs> Iowa voters right. that has Ted Cruz at 24 percent, Donald Trump at 19, and then I guess Rubio uh, at six, 17. At yeah. 17. Are, are you saying we can't really trust that? I'm saying you've got to be you've got to be extremely careful with these polls. Well, and there's a number of other things there. We're still two, almost two months away from, from Iowa, and Iowa voters are notorious for making up their minds at the last moment. It's an extremely low turnout election out there. There are nearly two million voters in Iowa. Uh, the highest turnout that a Republican caucus ever got was 122,000 voters. Uh, and so what I have been doing in my Iowa vote, uh, polls and New Hampshire polls have been starting with a list of registered voters. And if you don't go out to vote regularly, I'm not going to call you. Because I'm not going to give you Where the Where do you get that list? You get that from the, the state, uh, Secretary of State in, yeah. in each of these states. And then you go through it and it tells you the age breakouts and gen you have all this information about regular voters. And then I am not going to give a voter who hasn't, uh, for an election poll, this is just for an election poll, this is not for a regular public policy poll. I am not going to give a voter who I know is not going to show up because of their past voting history the opportunity to get on the phone and lie to me and say that they will show up in this particular election. And what we found is that our, my poll yesterday had uh, Cruz up by five points over Trump. The CNN poll yesterday in Iowa had Trump up by 13 points over Cruz. And that's a you, wild swing. And it's a wild How swing. Are we and that's because to know? they used, a, they used this, the RDD method of contacting 2,000 adults and asking them if they would participate in the caucus. And they got about 27% who said they would participate in the Republican caucus. That translates to about 650,000 voters. Now, my poll translated to about 140,000 voters, which would still be a record turnout in a, in a Republican caucus. And we do think there's more interest in this caucus. But I think that, that's the huge difference. And that's what's happening now as these numbers and response rates and everything is getting low. Let me ask you to paint a picture of how a poll is done. I somehow have this mental image of 10 to 20 people at a, phone, at a phone bank, ran, you know, randomly dialing, it, it, is that reality? Or is, how, does, how do you paint the picture? How do you take a poll over a couple of days? So we're actually uh, doing our 200th survey ever for the Rutgers Eagleton poll um, that will be coming out in the next several weeks. So we just did a poll. So I'll take you through what we just went through. Um, it involves a lot of stress. Um, a lot of telephone numbers, as you mentioned. We actually have an all-student call center at Rutgers University. Uh, all of our calling is done on property or called in-house a lot of times. So these are all students from the Rutgers community. We have an incredibly diverse student population. You pay them? We do pay them, of course. <laughs> um, they are paid employees of us, uh, and they do our calling. So How many? Uh, we have about 27 per shift, so, but this employs hundreds of Rutgers students. And so what we do is we make up the questionnaire, like all of us do here on stage. We program the questionnaire. 
the students or, or the call center employees call on the questionnaire and then we collect the data. So it's a very kind of, there's a lot of science that we think how happens. Long, how long is the exchange on the telephone? It could be, it depends on the survey. So it could be anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. Sometimes surveys will be hours at length, um, depending on bigger, more national studies. Not necessarily I'm saying with us, but there are studies out in politics that will actually sit face to face with, with respondents for an hour or more. Um, so that really kind of varies. But one of the big issues that maybe you're trying to hint at is, of course, you want to keep respondents engaged and you want to keep them on the phone. So that's kind of the art of polling, all these little challenges along the way of the mechanics of the process of trying to make sure that the respondent is staying engaged and interested. Not that many people in this room have 10 or 20 minutes right. at, a, at right. a time to give right. to a pollster, correct? Which goes back to Patrick's response rate, correct, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. But they, uh, what we find, and I'm sure you find the same thing, is if a person's going to pick up the phone, we got them. Right. If they answer the first question, they'll answer all the questions. Right. Yeah. The problem is getting them on the phone. Right. What can you add to the picture, or how does what uh, Ashley described uh, compare to how you do it? Um, it's very similar, although we don't have a call center. Uh, we don't employ FDU students. We actually outsource that job. So that's about the only difference. The only thing I would elaborate on, though, is the importance of the questionnaire itself, You know, the appropriate measurement, uh, you might say, um, because you have to be very careful in how you ask questions, not only in how you word them, um, but also in question order, because we know from research that question order effects can certainly pop up in surveys. So if you ask about one issue and then you follow up with something else, um, it can affect you know, the responses to that latter question. Uh, so you always have to be very careful uh, as a researcher in how you construct your questionnaire. Um, the way I do it is I will draft the initial questionnaire and then I vet it through a series um, of advisors, a, a group of advisors who will weigh in. And it's a very humbling experience because as much as I like to think that I'm quite good at writing objective uh, questions, oftentimes they will come back to me and say, oh, you know, you're really kind of revealing a bias here. And as a pollster, particularly when representing university, the last thing that I want to do um, is be seen as someone who leans one way or the other. So I have to be very careful uh, not only in how I interpret the data and make sure that you know, I'm really channeling just what the public is saying, but also in regard to how I construct the questionnaire. I think that's equally important. Give us an example of the wording of a question that your board or your advisors <laughs> would have a, a, would see some, some uh, right. inherent bias in. Well, it can be something as small as asking, you know, do you, you know, do you agree with this, with the following statement? And then you, you know, you, you read a statement. Um, simply not saying, you know, do you agree or disagree can bias the responses in an agree direction. So it doesn't even have to be something overt. It can actually be something as subtle as that. Um, you know, without thinking of, of something more concretely, I would just say it can be something as subtle as that that can actually affect uh, the response distributions. Um, why does polling seem more intense right now? Well, than, e than ever before. Why are we getting so many polls? I think, uh, let me just jump in here, I think a lot of it really has to do with the pace of the news cycle uh, and the extent to which the news really feeds off of polls. And so I think in many ways it's kind of a cycle. Um, I think the media is very, very interested in, in poll results. In fact, when we issue a press advisory uh, the day before saying that we're going to have numbers on whatever, um, you know, within minutes I have people calling asking, you know, can I, can I see those as quickly as possible? So I do think that a lot of it is very much contingent on the pace of the news cycle and the need to continually feed the beast, so to speak, uh, with new numbers. Anybody else? And I think also polling is what we, we adhere to, this type of science, this type of factual truth. Um, so like Krista was saying, with the news cycle, I think the news wants facts to base it up. Polling is supposed to be the voice of the people. It's supposed to be what the people want and think. So I think it's a very kind of satisfying thing for the news media to report on polls because it's not just an anecdote or an opinion of one person. They're supposed to be representative of the entire population. Patrick? Yeah, if, um, if only they actually looked at all the kinds of things that we asked the media. Right. That's we want when the when top, you say, want when you the say top the, number. When you say the intensity of the attention to polls, it's the intensity of, of, of horse race polls. I, I did a really great series of questions on the political implications of the Pope's visit to the U.S. and the political implications of the Pope's for American Catholicism. And that didn't get picked up anywhere near as much as what happened yesterday. And you talk about the, exactly what Chris talked about the news cycle. We released our Iowa poll yesterday at noon. And it had saturated the media <coughs> by the time 
CNN released their poll at 4 o'clock. So within four hours, um, the Monmouth poll was everywhere on these cable news channels on the internet. And then they had to change the, the, the talk about the two polls that had different results at 4 o'clock, but we had already penetrated so much because of how quickly this news cycle works. But they didn't talk about um, the question that we asked about top issues or, or a, a number of other things were not mentioned. It was, always, it was just the top the horse race numbers. And, uh, and that's one of the problems is that, and, and quite frankly, I mean, part of the things that we do at our, our universities is to raise the profile of our universities in, in what we do. And uh, that feeds the beast. Uh, the problem is, is that we, it's very, very difficult to break through uh, journalism's obsession with these horse race numbers, which quite frankly don't mean much, partially because <laughs> We've been seeing these error issues over the past couple of years, and partially because of how quickly these what things change. Whatever, whatever. There, <laughs> well, we saw the, gov the, gu the gubernatorial race in, in Kentucky uh, this uh, last month. Every poll had the winner wrong in that race. Uh, back in 2014, almost all the polls overstated uh, Democrats' support. We, uh, even overseas, the Israel. Israeli election, the Canadian, mm -hmm. not the Canadian, the Canadian election mm -hmm. was one, actually one of the offs where they actually got it all right. The British election. Yep, UK. Um, where the polls were all wrong. In fact, the only poll in the British election that was right was the one released that morning by SurveyMonkey. <laughs> I'm serious. And I, I'm going to tell you right now, and we're talking about the different methodology, pay attention to SurveyMonkey. What is uh, Survey Monkey? Survey we Monkey. all know SurveyMonkey is that free, you know, you can ask, you know, set up uh, appointments and all sorts of things and ask the silly questions in SurveyMonkey for free. They actually hired, right now they have two extremely, extremely good pollsters that they hired because um, um, the, and I can't remember his name, who died, uh, the head of Survey Monkey just died last year. Dick Holbert. Yeah. The, yes. And, um, uh, but he's, he really wanted to make a state, statement that we could actually do good polling with online polling methods. And he hired, uh, he had a good hire, now they have a second good hire. The first one is John Cohen, who was at the Washington Post, uh, and prior to that, ABC News, and then at the uh, Public Policy Institute in California. And then uh, Mark Blumenthal, who some of you may know as Mystery Pollster or the Huffington Post Pollster, um, and he just got hired. Uh, and they really want to look to see if they can do this. And, and I'm going to be paying actually close attention to them uh, among the internet polls to see if they have, figure out a method to, in, in a way to do this. You say that uh, it's good for the university to have its poll. No, n none of us had ever heard of Quinnipiac University <laughs> until they started polling. You're polling the nation and Iowa and New Hampshire, um, and that's getting your name, your university's name out there considerably. Are you polling Iowa, New Hampshire, we the just nation, just or just New, just New Jersey? Just New Jersey. Just New Jersey. And the idea is we hope that it brings attention to the other good stuff that we're doing. For example, one of the things that we've been doing with a non-probability method has, we've been tracking Sandy victims for the past three years now. And we have a panel of approximately 1,000 Sandy victims that we go back to year after year after year to see what their, their issues are, what's remaining, what, what's been improving, you know, where, where work still needs to be done. And then we feed that information back to public policymakers. And, and doing those high-profile polls allows us to do this other kind of really important work, too. How about FDU? Are you doing Iowa, New Hampshire, the nation, or just New Jersey? We're largely statewide with a few nationals thrown in. Um, so you are the two who are telling us how unpopular Chris Christie has become uh, in the state of New Jersey, right? Well, Is he here yet? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think well, of that. You're a step ahead of me. That's right. Yeah. Everything's great in New Jersey. Everything's great. Um, yes. Yes, so, so. But, but Patrick has as well. I think all three of us have basically found the same thing. This is, this is not Patrick I don't, I, don't, I don't even have to poll anymore to yeah. get Chris Christie annoyed at me. You so can just put your finger in the air. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Um, I, I think his story is fascinating, though, in terms of all three of us have seen with his polling. Mm -hmm. It has been a, a ride for a politician that we rarely see in politics in terms of the ups and downs of the numbers from Hurricane Sandy through last January, uh, through January 2014 until today. I mean, I think what fascinates the media, what fascinates New Jerseyans, what fascinates everybody is the fact that we have never seen or rarely have seen, maybe like some with, with George Bush, these ups and downs, these highs and lows. You know, usually we'll see politicians kind of steadily move along within a certain range, but it's, it's such a fascinating story, I think, and that's why there's so much coverage surrounding it. 
I'm interested to see what he talks about today. I, uh, we, we've heard BIA speeches from Governor Christie uh, before, and they're all about the state economy. Is he going to talk about that today? Is he going to talk about uh, terrorism and a more presidential uh, uh, approach to the remarks or meld the two? We'll find out shortly. Uh, you all do university polling. There are other kinds of polling. There's news organization polling, ABC News, Washington Post, or CBS News, New York Times. Um, there's also candidate polling, uh, where sometimes a candidate, I think, is misled by his own pollster into thinking he or she is doing better. How do you compare those three types of polls? Well, I think um, university polls, and I think also most media polls, um, are, are known for their objectivity and for the, the quality of what they're doing. Um, most of the time, you know, you have, you know, obvious transparency in their methods, and I think that's that's quite good, of course. Um, candidate polls, of course, you know, you usually don't really hear much about those in, unless somebody kind of, you know, goes off the record, so to speak, and you know says that you know, gee, we really thought that we were going to win this one. Our own, our own numbers were telling us this. Or they call reporters three weeks before an election and say, "We're ahead." Right. Yes, um. that's right. So I would say, just as a consumer, I'm sort of looking out at all of you, thinking that perhaps what you'd like to do is take away some, um, some things that you can use. You know, as you kind of go through life with polls. I would say again, university-based polls and um, media polls uh, with known uh, names behind them actually are quite, quite trustworthy. Other thoughts, other comments? I think also, um, and, and the three of us have all done this at, at points in time, I think one of the, the interesting things about being in a university is going perhaps a step farther or in a step in a more academic direction and looking at things like the psychology, uh, the, the political science, if you will, those yeah. kind of things behind the numbers. So we regularly do survey experiments, meaning we'll ask half of the sample, half of the people a question one way, we ask the other half another way and see if it makes a difference. And I think investigating those causal relationships and relationships in general is something the three of us pride ourselves on, where perhaps a news organization, especially political pollsters, will not go that in depth into the numbers or, or trying to really get at policy. Can I just jump in here for a second, though, to Ashley's point about you know doing experiments? We do that all the time as well. And occasionally I'll try to craft a press release out of these. It's so and hard. I often <laughs> kind of get the pushback. Well, can you, you know, what did you do here? Can you explain this a little bit? So give us an example of, of, of what you're talking about. So one of one of the greatest examples, like Patrick was saying, they kind of just look at the top line number. Over the summer, we had reported about um, do New Jerseyans want the governor to resign in light of 2016. We we asked it two ways. Half the sample was asked about that, half the sample was asked if the legislature forces him to resign, should he? And the numbers were much lower in that circumstance because someone shouldn't be pushed or forced to do something. But the media ignores that and they go for the top number of how many actually want him to go. Um, so, but it's, that always happens, like right. Lisa was saying, you know, we try to explain these experiments in the best terms we can and the information's <laughs> actually really fruitful, like with yeah. the gas tax, but you know, it's that top line number and that's I'll, what the media wants. I'll give wants. you right. a, a good example of this and one that's is, is easily, easily digestible and also one that gives you a kind of a warning as a consumer of what to do. Uh, going back to 2008, uh, the, the Lautenberg uh, uh, re-election bid in 2008. Another, a poll came out that said a majority of voters say that Lautenberg is too old. And so the headlines were age will be, a, a, age will be an issue in this campaign. And I asked the question, you know, is Lautenberg too old to be an effective senator? And I only got 33%, not a majority, <coughs> who said he was too old. And so then you get the questions about, well, what's the difference? I said, we're getting the same exact support in the vote choice question, so it's not a difference in our samples. Uh, and let's look at how the questions are worded. My question was worded, is Frank Lautenberg too old to be an effective U.S. Senator? The other question was worded, at age 84, is Frank Lautenberg too old to serve another six terms as U.S. Senator? Another six years. Another six years, yeah. So it had two pieces of information in there that were different from, from mine. One is, this is how old Frank Lautenberg is, and please think about six years from now. All right, so basically the poll is telling them to ask about 90. And I said, that's a problem, because you're giving information into, in the poll question that voters don't have. And I said, well, and reporters would come back to me and say, but it's true, he is 84 years old. I said, that's not the point. So I did a series of experiments in subsequent polls. And I asked, is an 84-year-old person too old to be a U.S. senator? And my standard question is, is Frank Lautenberg to, to be too old? And I found that that increased uh, 
by uh, the number of people who said yes by 12 points, which, by, adding the, one, age, by adding the age of 84. And then I said, think about six years from now. And that added another 7%. And suddenly, my 33% ended up being 53%, which is exactly the same as what the other poll was getting. So then I followed up and I said, oh, by the way, how old do you think Frank Lautenberg is? And the average guess was 75 when he was 84. I said, that was why, because a 75-year-old person is not too old to be a US senator, but an 84-year-old was. And most of what happened was only a quarter of voters knew that he was in his 80s, at least. But in the other poll sample, 100% of those voters knew that he was 84. So they no longer looked like the actual population of voters in New Jersey. They were now different. And that was the problem. So you got, to be an educated consumer, one of the things that I tell reporters all the time is, look at how the question See if they're, and this is what Krista was talking about. This is why we try to vet our questions well, is so that we're not introducing bias or new information or something that's going to make our sample suddenly different in terms of their knowledge base and the framework that they use to answer a question from the people on the, on the, in the population who are trying to represent. So, but that's, go ahead. Well, but that's all, that, I mean, yeah, but it's also difficult sometimes to do that because you know, you want to measure opinion, you don't, you don't necessarily want to create it on the fly, but oftentimes if you're asking about important matters of public policy, we know that the public is woefully ignorant of, of, of a lot of things, and so you're always trying to walk that fine line between giving them enough information to answer the question without creating, you know, adding so much information that you're actually simply creating that opinion when it really doesn't exist. So it's a tough, it's a oh, tough uh, By the way, I should point out that that, that other poll that used those that the 84, that's not either of those. <laughs> um, are there polls out there that skew toward one party or another? I remember back maybe 10 years ago, I think it was Rasmussen polling. I used to discount by three or four points whatever they said about the Republicans because I somehow I got it into my head that that, that was a Republican-leaning poll. There's one now that you see today. Some, uh, sometimes I think PPP? it's called public policy polling. I don't yeah. know which way it leans. Left. Left. Okay. Yes. So there are polls out there that get reported <clears throat> that lean one way or another. Yes. Yeah, most definitely. But I, I think you know, like Patrick was saying, with the two different Iowa polls the other day, I think that's why it's important for poll aggregation as well. That's a, a big right. thing in the field right now. Real Clear Politics and Huffington Post pollster are two leading poll aggregators. Uh, Nate Silver, who I'm sure you may have heard, he's, he's somewhat of a household name in terms of political sphere stuff now, um, was, was huge in terms of uh, poll aggregating now on his website, 538. I think we, we at least try to mitigate some of this bias with pollsters or polling organizations leaning one way or the other by doing these aggregations of polls to have a better average estimate of what's going on. What did you all think of the aggregations used to determine who should get into the main debate in, on the Republican side and, and not? Was, was that uh, valid? Well, no. Um, it was, my, and mine was one of the polls that was used in, in the first uh, couple of debates. Um, and I put out in my press release in the poll a table which showed the exact margins of error for all the candidates to show how they overlapped with one another. And then after you get past the first three or four candidates, the bottom <coughs> ten candidates could have easily changed places. So Just based been, on the margin of error. Based on the margin of error, it was built into the sample. So it was unfair. And that's, that's it only was unfair one to Chris Christie to put him at the kids' table in the last debate. Uh, based, based solely on polling, yes. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the, basically, these, uh, the, the news organizations should, should man up and make these decisions themselves. And the other, than, yeah, and the other thing this, that this did is I think it nationalized this at a very early stage. I mean, of course, we're really focused on the two, prime, the two early states, Iowa and New Hampshire, um, but they weren't looking at those. They were looking at how people performed in the, nation, the national level, which is quite early for that. This is why Chris Christie is going to be in the next debate, because the next sponsor changed the, uh, changed the criteria to include Iowa and New Hampshire polls, and he's doing well enough in New Hampshire that he's going to be back on the main stage. And nationally, voters just aren't engaged right now. I mean, again, they're engaged right. in Iowa, New Hampshire, maybe South Carolina. They're not engaged at the national level, and that is what we're using to judge them. For also, some listen, let me give you a hint about these national horse race numbers, <clears throat> is that if they violate the first uh, premise of election polling, is that when I poll an election, the election that I'm polling actually has to exist. There is no such thing as a national primary election, right? So when we do this national primary polling, it's nonsense. And one of the problems that we have, we, and, and Krista mentioned before the question order, 
a lot of these polls bury the question about who you support way back in the poll after they ask about a whole bunch of other issues. And that's why you're seeing all these numbers all over the place. And they're worded differently as well with so many yep. candidates. Different polls have different ways of asking. I think I heard there was one type of poll that was either through text or online and you would get one page of, of uh, Republican candidates and then a second page of Republican candidates and you had to click more to continue. I mean, that's just, that's what we're judging national debates on. Right. Um, I've seen polling that suggests that Hillary Clinton runs behind many of the major Republican candidates. Is that where things really stand right now? I've, again, I've seen both. You You've know, I saw, I've seen, yeah, they're, 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 both of those statements are accurate. So why, why do you think that happens? You know, again, I think it could be dependent on the question order, uh, all of the things that we've talked about today. So I think you'd have to really dig in and look at the polls individually to try to discern why some differ than others. Part of it because there's not a real, I mean, people don't focus on a hypothetical election in the same way they focus on a real election. I mean, that's just really what it boils down to. Hypothetical, they know they're, when we ask them, who are you gonna vote for if the election were held today and it's six months before the election? I have not fooled one person to thinking that they missed the election, right? They know it's six months from now. So they might say, you know what? I'm gonna say right now it's Trump because I, I like that, how that sounds right now. I think it's good to have him in the race. Right. And I think what you're getting right now is more like affect, you know, how people feel emotionally toward people yeah. as opposed to any kind of like cognitive engagement with, you know, who's going to be the best for leadership for this country. Well, we have about 10 more minutes uh, and I'm going to invite anybody who wants to ask a question to do so. Uh, I saw a hand. Uh, do we have a mic for, for the audience? Bring it over, would you? Right up front here. Thank you. Thank you. Would you I, identify I, yourself? Yes, uh, Gary Farr, Local 102, and uh, honored to be here today. Uh, can you uh, just talk to the margin of error, how you come to that uh, percentage? Because it, it varies, I believe, in, in poll to poll. Well, the margin of error is dependent on the size of your sample relative to your population. So um, obviously, but there's also a point of diminishing returns. So for example, in, an, in a national survey, um, you know, you can do a poll, you know, of 11, 1,200 people um, and have a, a fairly, you know, a, a very respectable margin of error. The more what is a respectable margin of error? You know, two to three, four percent, something along those lines. And the way you interpret that is what you're looking at when any percentage is, is going to vary um, anywhere from plus or minus, say, two percent. Um, relative to the population that you actually sampled from. So what you're going to want to see in a, in a margin of error are smaller numbers, of course, because that denotes accuracy. Um, but your, your, your margin of error is always going to be related to the size of your sample relative to the size of your population. And there's, a for, there's just a formula for that. And by the way, this, the, the actual precise way to talk about the margin of error is that if we went out and repeated this poll 100 times, 95 times out of 100, we are confident that we will get a result that's within this margin. Of course, five times out of 100, we're not confident. Not. That we, so it could be outside of it. We don't, so there's a lot of error even within the margin of error. Which is why you're going to have misses, right? I mean, five times out of 100, when you have so many polls out there, you are going to have the occasional misfire. Um, the gas tax has been polled a number of times by probably all three of your polls. Um, can you give me an example of how the wording of the gas tax question could produce significantly different results? We've did survey experiments on the gas tax almost every time we've asked it over the past year and a half. So we will ask it with the different plans that are proposed in the state legislature. We ask it under the context of um, give the roads are badly in need of repair. Uh, there needs to be improvements. This will wholly go for those improvements. We've asked it in terms of it will take this much more out of your pocket um, annually on average for the Jersey driver and all of those things make a huge difference. Now we've noticed more recently when we've asked it any of these ways New Jerseyans are adamantly opposed no matter what the context. Um, there's, there's a little bit more support when you're talking about the roads being under repair but I think now and I think you guys saw this at FDU that, that there's just kind of this inherent distrust that New Jerseyans have right. that the money will actually be used for that. Yeah. So, so the roads, the condition of the roads is a more powerful argument 
then you'll save $600 in repairs. Is that what you're saying? Then, then something like $180 per year, it will cost you $180 per year more. Of course, nobody wants any more money to be taken out. Nobody wants a higher tax. This is the one tax as New Jerseyans that is lower than almost everywhere else. So, you know, when you tar t t start talking about what this cost could be to, to them, that's when New Jerseyans get even more strongly opposed it's, to the issue. It's, um, it, it's, you can include information in the question, and, and there's different ways to include that information, like what you said, the roads are need repair, or this is how much it'll cost, or it'll be offset by an estate tax, or uh, all those kinds of things. Or you can ask them in different ways before or after you ask the gas tax question. So there's all different ways to go about this. We've all asked it a different way, and we've all come up with a majority who said that they were opposed to the gas tax. Right. But let me get you a, a little hint here is that there's a, this thing called salience, uh, which means how important is this to me? And yeah, people don't like to see their gases, gas tax go up, but um, you know, if I, having been around the <coughs> New Jersey politics for, for over 20 years now, a gas tax could be raised with very little political price to pay for those who are in elected office in the legislature. It's not it's, salient? It's, it won't be salient enough because the gas tax right now is low and people will get over it by the time that you get to the next thing. There might be one or one or two casualties in this whole thing, but there'll be very few casualties. It's not the kind of political issue that people Paul take. Paul Sarlo will be a casualty issues. based on what he said in the last hour? I don't think so. Okay. No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, and also to go off of Patrick's point, so we've also asked, you know, would it be a better time to raise the gas tax now with gas prices being so low? And New Jerseyans are really amenable to that. So like Patrick was saying, the time is, is perhaps right. We're supposed to see perhaps $1.50 gas by Christmas. Um, you know, so it's, it's those kind of things and that kind of wording that when you ask, well, okay, if it did get raised, would now be an okay time? But I think the two central objections that we've seen to people, uh, among people who say that they don't want to see it raised is, um, obviously the first is taxes are already too high in the state, so why should I pay more? But then also, you know, people simply don't trust legislators to do with what, what they said they were going to do with the money. So I think this speaks to the continuing distrust that people have for elected officials, which is unfortunate. Yeah, there's yeah. a third, I, got a, I, I have a third one, because I have those two things too. The, the other one was, as I found this uh, incredible, like lurking belief that there's money somewhere else in the state that, that, that <laughs> people believe that we can tap into. And that's the other part of it too, is that they believe that, that it's part of not trusting government. That it's there. They believe that there's something they're hiding from us, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, in the back there. Uh, I'm fascinated, as Who everyone is, with, uh, pardon me? Identify yourself. Uh, Bob, Mit Bob Mitchell with the Atlantic Wind Connection. Uh, I'm fascinated, as everyone is, with uh, the horse race questions. But I'm wondering if you or if you've seen any polling that would indicate as to how far to the right uh, Donald Trump or Cruz or any of those that seem to be appealing to the, the base uh, uh, racist uh, attitudes, et cetera. How, how far can they go before they lose even the people on the far right that are supporting them now? Who wants to tackle that? We'll find that, we'll find that out in February. Yeah. So, so you, yeah. you, you haven't seen any polling, you haven't asked that question? I, it's, you can't, it, that's how again, you that's it? predicted. It's a question you can't ask people to say, okay, when are you going to finally own up and say that this guy's too far to the right to you? Just can't ask that question. It may have happened yesterday. It might have. You're right. It would be interesting to see. I, and I bet it didn't, actually, yeah. to be honest with you. Donald Trump, there's a, there's a core support of Donald Trump that's about 25% of Republican voters who, and this is a question I have asked, are absolutely hold the uh, Republican leadership in contempt of their own party, the leadership of their own party. And we don't see that on the Democratic side, on the Republican side. Those are the people who are voting for Donald Trump. So it really doesn't matter what he says, because whatever he says shows that he holds the, the party leadership in contempt too. So that's exactly why they like him. So they're not gonna leave him until he gets off the stage. The question is, can the other candidates coalesce around somebody who's not like that? And we'll see what happens. Yes, John. John Leone, just out of curiosity, any sense as to how poll results could influence uh, the actual positions that the voters may take uh, subsequently? In other words, a, a poll showing someone in the lead having people that are undecided choosing to join a bandwagon and thereby affecting the electorate. Sure, there, there's certainly evidence for that. Um, we, we've, we've seen that in political science research. Um, there's also the, uh, the effect of, you know, kind of agenda setting, which basically means that 
um, you know, pollsters will ask, you know, what are the top issues um, that, you know, that you think are the most important for the country or state to address? Um, and then, you know, how you choose what those issues are then gets kind of played back in the media. And so that becomes this kind of driving force in, any, in, in, in elections in that kind of context. So there's certainly that, that as well. Yeah. Shout it out. <laughs> Walter Brash, uh, county firm at Connor Davies. Um, I'm not sure who said uh, about poll fatigue, but I'm, for one, very fatigued. But um, do you feel in these news network polls, um, and we constantly hear about the left and the right all the time, Fox right, everything else left, is there bias in those polls? Because I've seen it where they poll the similar types of questions and get dramatically different results. Depending on what station you're saying, like a Fox poll versus a no. an NBC poll or something. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, no. I would. Yeah, I would just go back to my earlier statement that I think most media polls are quite good. Yeah. So you yeah. guys. Including, including, yeah. including, including Fox News. Absolutely. Yeah, Fox I, I know the. Yeah. I, I think we've met or most of the people who run all those different polls. There's they're not biased. I mean, it's just a difference in, in maybe the framework that they approach it with but not uh, a political bias on the, in terms of the pollsters. Right, and how the numbers are interpreted and how they're covered and how they choose to you know, package numbers and present them in a certain way. That, that's not the job, you know, that, that's not the responsibility of the pollster. We do our best job to make sure that we're being transparent and objective. And then ultimately what happens to them is, is very much out of our control. And remember, there are multiple news outlets that are usually on one poll. So, you know, New York Times CBS poll, um, right. ABC Washington Post poll. So, you know, whether or not you may believe that they're on the same side or they have the same slant, you know, they're, they're all very respectable polls in the field. I think what we were talking about earlier was kind of the, the political pollsters that are polling for candidates and, and political affiliated organizations. But as a, as a consumer of polls, what you should always ask is to see the methodology, see the questions, um, because, you know, you can ultimately be the, 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 the judge of, you know, how accurate someone is. Click that well. link in the article that talks about go right. see our methodology, go see our question wording. All three of us probably straight go for that instead of reading the analytical article itself. Let me ask you a question about 2017. Um, I assume none of you have <clears throat> polled the gubernatorial candidates, the potential gubernatorial candidates yet. Is that correct? We've pulled favorability right. on, on certain uh, can, uh, possible candidates. Who? Uh, we've, we've been tracking Senator Sweeney. We've been tracking Lieutenant Governor Guadano. Um, I believe that's, that's our main ones. Uh -huh. uh, I saw about a month ago um, a poll of name recognition of Democratic potential candidates, and it had uh, I is there a firm called Millennium or, uh, I can't remember who did it. It was not one of the polling firms you hear of. Um, Sweeney's name recognition was at about 50%. I think this was a poll done for Fulop. It was done for well, Fulop. I, I think I remember that. Yeah. Uh, well, Relesniak was second at mm -hmm. about 28%. Fulop was third at about 17%. <clears throat> and Phil Murphy was fourth. Uh, at about 10 percent. Uh, does any of that mean anything yet? I think all it means is name recognition at this point. You know, and, and at this point, this early point, that I think that's good news. You know, so in our polls, we have tracked um, some of those same names over time, and we've seen very little change, with Senator Sweeney being at the top of, of name recognition. But beyond that, I'm not sure it means much. Anybody else? No, I completely agree. All right. Anybody else in the audience? All right. Uh, let me consult my notes for a second. <laughs> I think we've been told to sort of stretch this out a little bit longer. We're waiting for, <laughs> we're waiting for the governor. Uh, Krista asked me when we started, is the governor usually on time? I said, sometimes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> other times he gets on, here on time, but he stays in the suburban for 20 minutes on the phone before yeah. You know what's fascinating about the, the, the governor, and because I've now polled him, not just in New Jersey, but in Iowa and New Hampshire and nationally and, and all these things, is, is the difference in how he's perceived 
outside of the state and what things that they do know about him from, from the state. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that was, I think my poll was the first one in New Hampshire that showed that he took his negative favorabilities there and had flipped them to a positive. And that was the first start of where he was starting to rise in New Hampshire before he got the union leader endorsement, some other endorsements. Um, but it's interesting what I heard about Chris Christie out there. And it was, and I actually went out to Iowa and actually did one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, voters out there too, kind of get a better sense of what our polling was saying. And uh, it's interesting. I mean, the, the one thing that they hold against him was what the so-called Obama hug, because that, that kind of set him aside as somebody who gave Obama a second term, like he was some, somehow single-handedly responsible for that. Which and New Jerseyans loved. Right, and New Jerseyans loved because he was just doing his job, but it's like, and, and of course, and those of us and who And it was followed, not a, a hug. We and it wasn't a hug, it, it was kind of video. like that. It was a pat on the yeah, back. Yeah, and it wasn't a hug. There was a, you know what happened is they, they started circulating a picture from Hurricane Irene, where there was more of a, right. of a hug. So it kind of but it conflated, but the point was, is that he uh, you know, hurt Romney and helped, helped Obama. And that's something that they held against him as a mortal sin. They were willing to overlook it back after in the post-Sandy uh, time when it looked like he was going to be the savior of the Republican Party. And then when Bridgegate hit, they said, oh yeah, now I remember that Obama hug again. And that's what he's had to overcome. That's the main thing. Not Bridgegate, not any of these other things that we talk about here in New Jersey, not the pension issues and any of that. It, it's been that Obama hug, that, that he's not a true conservative, not a true Republican. And he has been, we're looking at the numbers in New Hampshire, he's been successful in able to, being able to overcome that. But Patrick, don't you think that in regard to his ability to turn his favorability and favorability around in New Hampshire is um, a result of his ability to engage in the retail politics of New oh. Hampshire, right? The ability there to really- There is nobody in either a Republican or Democratic field who has the talent that he has one-on-one -on -one, uh, and going out there and doing that, of course, and voters in New Hampshire, almost every voter in New Hampshire who goes out to vote in this primary will have seen one of these candidates in person, at least one of these candidates in person. And I actually asked that question on, on a couple of my New Hampshire polls. Have you seen any of these candidates in the person and, what, and in who? And every time I ask it, Chris Christie is at the top of the list of people that uh, voters have seen in person. You, you say people don't ask you about Bridgegate. I was in New Hampshire for a couple of days and uh, as Christie was walking through the state fair, one guy yelled out, shut any bridges lately? Uh, <laughs> That was a Democrat, by the way, who was doing that, so, yeah. And now Donald Trump is calling Christie out on Bridgegate. Um, uh, Trump and Christie have been very polite toward one another throughout this whole campaign, and we know they have a relationship of sorts, or had a relationship. Uh, but this uh, latest statement of Trump's about shutting down the borders to incoming Muslims caused Christie yesterday to say that's ridiculous uh, and only someone who hasn't really been in government would think that was a good policy. And then Trump fired back uh, last yeah. night mm -hmm. and said uh, that Christie knew about the bridge closing, he had to know. Just like Trump's been saying that uh, the, the sister and the mother of the terrorist couple in San Bernardino knew what was going on. He's now saying Christie knew Most about Bri Bridgegate. Uh, this is a badge of honor for Chris Christie. I mean, this is like the best news Chris Christie could get, that Donald Trump has decided to go after him. Yeah. Because Donald Trump only goes after people he sees as a threat. And that means Chris Christie is being seen as a threat right now. And that's exactly what Chris Christie wants. Now, of course, that's the, the flip side of this is now other candidates are probably going to start paying closer attention to Chris Christie. But when, when he got into the race in, in New Hampshire, uh, when Donald Trump got into the race in New Hampshire, we asked voters, who would they vote for if Donald Trump did not do that? And Chris Christie was their number one thing. So he's hurting him the most in New Hampshire. And that's why we're going to see this Who's play out a little bit. Trump is hurting Christie the most in, in New Hampshire. Hampshire. Yep. All right. Uh, <laughs> I got the time signal. We stretched it a bit. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all.